Welcome back to this, our second panel this afternoon on a, a quarter century of public religions in a global secular age. I introduced myself earlier. I'm Tom Banchoff, and I'm delighted to be up here with uh, Charles Taylor, with Archbishop Goodjock, and of course with Jose Casanova for this discussion. And the reason Jose is up here is an unfortunate one. Our colleague Nilla Fergula uh, has fallen ill uh, with COVID. She made it all the way here. And uh, just as she was nearing the finish line, um, fell ill. Uh, I understand she's doing fine um, in good care, but cannot join us. Uh, and interestingly, or unfortunately, Peter Vanderveer, before that, another of Jose's great colleagues based in Europe, um, came down with COVID. He did not make the flight, uh, but he's also not here. Uh, but we're delighted to have, nevertheless, a great panel. And because Nilofer can't join us, Jose can. So it'll give us a more direct way to carry on the dialogue with him. Um, so you'll notice uh, from the title of the panel, A Quarter Century of Public Religions in the Global Secular Age, there were kind of merging two book titles there. Uh, and the idea um, of evoking Charles's great book from 2007, A Secular Age, is again, as we've done throughout this whole conference, to build bridges between Jose's past work and his present work, but also his work and that of his friends and colleagues over the years, people he's influenced and been influenced by. And so in that context, Charles, we're delighted that you can join us. And um, Reverend Gudziak, you've long engaged Jose around issues of religion in the public square in Ukraine. And now you're involved, of course, in the heroic struggle of the Ukrainian people against Russian aggression. We're delighted that you can join us. The way we're going to do, um, do this is uh, I'll briefly introduce uh, them in a little more detail, because not everyone here knows them both. And certainly, others will be watching online and deserve a little background. Um, and once we've done that, I will ask Charles and Reverend Gudziak to each uh, speak for six to eight minutes, as we did on the first panel, sharing their own views um, of Jose's work and its contemporary significance uh, in very different registers, but I think complementary registers. And then we'll give Jose directly a chance to respond. We'll have a bit of a conversation here on stage and then throw it open for a wider discussion with you all. So with that, as I said, just a short formal introduction in the spirit of an informal gathering. Uh, Charles Taylor is Professor Emeritus of Philosophy at McGill University in Montreal and a leading scholar at the intersection of religion, secularity, and modernity, the author of many classic works, including The Sources of the Self, The Making of Modern Identity in 1989 and A Secular Age, which has already been invoked in different ways. He's the recipient of many prizes. I'll just mention a couple, the Templeton Prize and the Kyoto Prize for his life's work. The Most Reverend Bor Boris Gudziak is the seventh Metropolitan Archbishop of Philadelphia of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church. He also serves as a member of the church's permanent synod and is head of the Department of External Church Relations. And in that capacity is playing a critical role in Ukraine's struggle for freedom and independence in the war. Among his many other responsibilities, Archbishop Gudjak also serves as president of Ukrainian Catholic University in Lviv, an institution to which Jose, in particular, the Berkeley Center, Notre Dame, which is also represented here, are all bond bound to by bonds of cooperation and solidarity amidst this terrible conflict. So thank you both for joining us. Um, I'm not going to introduce Jose. <laughs> and uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Charles. Yeah, well, thank you very much. And I'm very pleased to be here because I owe a tremendous debt to, to Jose, as is pretty evident if you read the two books, one coming after the other. <clears throat> because Jose did a great uh, work in breaking certain log jams of two simple ideas of secularization and two simple ideas of, of the role of religion and so on, and opened the road. And also, I have to say, both um, Jose and Hans Joas, were, we were together in uh, Biko when I, when I actually uh, 
uh, wrote the book, wrote the final version, and we had regular meetings. And it, it, it is a really tremendous thing. Good effect. We could, I could try out all sorts of ideas and throw them into the ash can if they didn't work out before I finished writing. So I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, and what I'd like to uh, try to throw in another angle from which we can look at this whole phenomenon, which I think is relevant. Uh, Craig was mentioning something about seeing all these developments in a certain civilizational constellation context of that. And there is a feature of it, I think, which is worth bringing out again. We'll take it a change, which I want to give the example in the Catholic Church, but I think it existed also in other religions. It's a change in how you, how the faithful understand their position in history. Uh, we had, take the Catholic Church, right? in the years running up to the end of the Second World War, we had this tremendous stance of called anti-modernism. So there's a certain sense that at a certain point, the truth got defined. And then you have to fight to keep people in line and to prevent any deviation and moving away. And the conditions of the more recent world might lead people in a certain direction. You have to corral them in. When you come to Vatican II, let's think of the background of Vatican II, the theological background, which uh, must have had a very deep influence in my life because it hit me just at the right time, thinking of Jesuits like Luderbach and, and Congar. What they did was they went right back to the fathers and saw that that benchmark for anti-modernism was actually very much more recent and very, very questionable. And from this, they derived a new idea of how the faith exists in time. And it must, by remaining true to its sources, it involves changing, looking at the world, seeing how it, it can thrive in the world. And Vatican II was an attempt to define that. And I think that that is made a really fundamental difference, not just in the Catholic Church but in a much broader civilization for other, other faiths as well. And one of the great uh, features of the new sense of what it is to live in the world as a Catholic or as Protestant, or for that matter, as a Buddhist or a Muslim and so on, was uh, precisely that, the relationship between the different faiths. And you can see this, the time works out. You see that you get at the very end of the Second World War, around then you get that great book by Carl Jaspers the, on the Axial Age. It drops out of sight, and then it begins to come up again with Schmuel Eisenstadt particularly, right? Suddenly it's kind of time bomb exploding. And the, you know, we mentioned all the other books, uh, uh, about Bella and so on, is also giving the same time perspective, but like the Carl Jaspers book, with a new idea of what it is to relate across these different faiths. And then I think of another timeline, which I think connects with this. I remember, you know, I was very young at the end of the war, there was a certain ecumenicism. There was an ecumenicism of let's not you know, curse at each other, condemn each other, let's get together certain practical um, projects in common. And I've seen that develop further to an ecumenicism of friendship, an ecumenicism of deep mutual interest, an ecumenicism of even being inspired by certain figures in other other confessions, right? So we get, the, I think this whole shift has made a new world, a new situation in which the whole issue about secularism and, and the faith is uh, seen in a new light. So that you, uh, but one more thing to add, that caused a reaction. And the reaction is, uh, was, a, was a hyper anti-modernist, or if you like, no, I, would, I use the word primordialism here. 
that is, you look to the past and you find a moment when things were supposedly defined. And then we can go outside of the Christian, different Christian faiths and look at the Islamic world and we find something like the same the phenomenon, that is a very fierce phenomenalism, uh, primordialism, Salafism, or in various modes. And in that, you get the opposite attitude to the ecumenical. That is, the, the Christians that are just dying to have a fight with the Muslims are the ones who are primordialists, and the Muslims which are dying to get rid of the any, uh, any kind of deviation, and particularly other religions, are deeply primordialist. So that, is, that becomes a tremendous continuing conflict that we're always in in our society. So the picture that I gave earlier is the Irene moving toward, but it's in a field in which there is intense conflict against that. And this, I think, is one of the as it were, big contexts in which we have to think out what it is to <clears throat> relate to the secular and to other, other faiths in which we're now operating. Thank you. Thank you very much for those introductory remarks. Reverend? Well, thank you for this invitation, and it's a real honor to be here. I'm kind of, a, kind of an outlier, not being of, of the profession uh, with sociologists, <laughs> philosophers. I used to be a historian. Uh, but um, I know Jose kind of a long time because his uh, in-laws were friends of my parents. And I knew, <laughs> I knew about Ica. Uh, they lived in Rochester. We lived in Syracuse. And you know there was this. Jose, the Spaniard that came into their, their life. Uh, and he did come into the life of uh, the Ukrainian community very strongly. And that's something I would like to say something about uh, in reference to the book. Because if Ukraine was not a case study uh, in the book, it became uh, another, uh, let's say, uh, argument for many of the theses that are, are in the book. And when um, Jose started coming with some regularity uh, to Ukraine, independent Ukraine in the 90s, and began writing about it, uh, his, he, he played an important role in analyzing the religious situation, accompanying it, uh, and in some ways you know, catalyzing certain things. Uh, what, what is the situation? A lot of people are surprised by this war. Most Ukrainians are very shocked by it, traumatized by it, but they're not surprised because there's centuries of historical precedent. And you know this is, this is the issue, whether it's with the European political leaders or even the Holy See. Uh, when, when the surprise is expressed now, we say, well, you know, maybe, maybe you could have listened to what we were saying before. And Jose was saying it. Jose was saying that there is a big difference in these societies and in their religious life. Um, and they can be Russian speaking or they can be Ukrainian speaking. But look at the differences between what is happening in this political state and the one and what is happening in the northern neighborhood. Um, Ukraine has close to 100 confessional groups. Uh, some of them are tiny. 15 of them belong to a unique organization uh, that is called the All Ukrainian Council of Churches and Religious Organizations. And it has 15 kind of churches or con say groups of churches which account for 90% of the faithful. And um, Jose, very early on, started um, pointing this out, pointing out the significance of this, uh, pointing out the analogies, uh, similarities with American society or North American societies. Uh, and uh, that was not just uh, a process of 
you know, diagnosis, uh, x-raying from the outside, but I don't know what Jose is like in other circumstances. Um, but in Ukraine, he gets engaged, he gets involved, he helps people, he makes connections. And uh, you know, when I think of Jose, I think of joy. Uh, somebody mentioned uh, that you know he, he they ask for you know uh, a song. <laughs> we in Ukraine also ask for songs because Jose sings very well in Ukrainian. <laughs> he is he is absolutely fluent <laughs> in a highly inflected language. Uh, and if you listen over here, him, him and Ika are speaking in Ukrainian uh, when they're we're conversing privately. So Jose got involved in you know, publication projects. Um, he's a longtime board member of uh, our university's International Institute for of Philosophy and Contemporary Issues. And he's opened doors for many, many young scholars. Um, but what accompanies all that is uh, a continual explication of some of the basic uh, findings of the book being celebrated today. Uh, that book, if I may say, I think it's a celebration of diversity. It's, um, it, it's a way of um, speaking ironically about differences and, and um, really with a certain joy looking at the richness of the human spiritual uh, quest. And I think that's worth celebrating. And I, I must say uh, it's, it's rare that occasions like this are, are held. Often they're after the funeral. <laughs> um, it's nice that uh, this is happening when you're very much alive. But uh, I think anybody that will read any of Jose's articles on religious life in Ukraine, and in it he does compare it with religious life in, in Russia, uh, you, will, you will understand better what is going on uh, now. Uh, so maybe I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much, and we'll have a chance to get into the current situation in some more detail. And maybe that's a good bridge to, Jose, do you have any initial thoughts? Yeah. Well, first I want to say how uh, grateful I am to have this opportunity to have such a symposium of intellectual and personal friends, because I, I always thought of this not so much as an intellectual debate, but really getting together a, a symposium in the true platonic sense of the term. Um, and so I'm very pleased uh, to say this. Uh, obviously, um, I may say that yes, it opened new ways, but and it's an optimist reading of entering religion in the public sphere because the reading then was so negatively in every respect. But of course, I never had any illusion about religion being always good or all religions. It enters the public sphere, but. Uh, you know, civil society is not always good. And uh, the, the cacophony of voices in civil society, mobilization can be mobilization toward fascism and toward religious fundamentalism. So I never put it, even the chapter in the United States on evangelical fundamentalism is meant precisely, on the one hand, uh, to point out the need to engage in those debates, in these conversations. Obviously, things have changed in such a way, and we now have such a polarization on all these issues, right? Uh, partly having to do with uh, the transformation fundamentally, it's already in the book, by the question of gender. The question of gender was not there so central. And since then, obviously, it has become one of the fundamental issues. I think the problem today is not so much religious pluralism. We've come to terms with, for religions living together. What we are not yet ready to do is for moral pluralism for different concepts of morality to live together in the same society. This is the Durkheimian question. He calls it the religion, but it's really the moral question. Can our modern societies live together 
with deep moral pluralism. We know we can live together with religious pluralism, but can we live together with moral pluralism? And I think this is where the global secular age comes. If we are going to survive, it has to be through some kind of really accepting this pluralism as unavoidable. And this is where secularism comes in. Secularism, not to put religion in its place, but precisely to make possible this living together of moral plurality and religious plurality. And I think this is the crucial issue, right? And, um, and yes, you are right. Uh, India did much better before, and now really, really, we are following, we're going back to 1492, right? To the Westphalian system of confessionalization of the state. So, yes. So, yes, I think that the global secular age, we just have to accept this. As a, and this was, for me, what, of course, uh, Vatican II meant. Is basically, Gaudium et Spes is a celebration of our modern world. Again, with all kinds of critical views, because it's, it sees it with a lot of problems, but also is one of engagement, of positive engagement. And of course, the acceptance of nostra etate, our age as one of religious pluralism. Defining our age fundamentally is one of religious pluralism. And dignitatis humane, of course, religious freedom, not doctrines have rights, not uh, the notion that only truth has rights and error has no rights, it radically changes. Persons have rights, not doctrines. And from this, everything else. Uh, uh, so it's this combination of the possibility of institutional structures that protect pluralism to change from the rights of religious institutions to the rights of persons, precisely to search truth and to convert to their own, to find their own commitments, and then the acceptance of inevitable religious pluralism as something unavoidable. Ukraine, of course, was for me a fascinating story. Precisely, a, mainly an orthodox society, majoritarian, but it had a very important Greek Catholic component, which, of course, in terms of the perception of Ukrainian nationalism had been a crucial, crucial factor in modern Ukrainian nationalism. And yet, uh, when I arrived, there were three uh, Orthodox churches competing with one another, all of three claiming to be the national church, and one Greek Catholic church also claiming to be the national church. And then once you have four churches, we know from the United States, none of them comes, becomes the church, and they become denominations. And the sects, the minorities, become also denominations. And this is what this council means. All council, all Ukrainian council, of churches and religious organizations in which you have together all the Orthodox communities and the Greek Catholics and the Roman Catholics and all the Protestants, there's huge variety, and the Muslims and the Jews, and the presidency of the council rotates every six months so that any of them is equal to be the president of the association. It has nothing to do with the state. It was not the state. In Russia, you also have such a council, but it's a council organized by the state for the state and, and with the state. So the idea is this is really an organization of civil society. And of course, they work with the government. They work on issues of legislation, and they work together. But the fact that they have first all the religious groups, Muslim, Jews, Protestants, Catholics, Orthodox, have to come together to some consensus before they, they can propose anything to the government to take into account for legislation, obviously, is a, is a, is a crucial difference in this respect. So the fact that they are not working, if you wish, as lobbying agencies for their own churches, but they are working together as lobbying agencies for what they consider to be the common good of Ukrainian society. And this is amazing. This is amazing because you cannot find such, such, such thing in any European country. In the same way, of course, you cannot find it the same in a country after the uh, election of Zelensky as president, that both the president and the prime minister of Ukraine were Jews. And before that, right after Maidan, the four highest office of the land belonged to different denominations. You have the president who was an Orthodox, but a Poroshenko, but of the Moscow Patriarchate. That's why he wanted to have a Ukrainian Orthodox Church, because he didn't want, after the war, he could not anymore be part of the Moscow Patriarchate. So he wanted the ecumenical patriarch to legitimate their church and be in communion with global orthodoxy. And the second in command, the prime minister then was a Greek Catholic. 
Yes, yes, yes. And the head of parliament, who became then the secretary of security Come. council, was a Baptist minister. What's his name again? <laughs> it doesn't matter. Yeah. I'm getting all in the name, but anyhow. <laughs> and, and the fourth was Groisman, the speaker, I mean, the, the head of the Verhoevna Rada, who later became prime minister, again, a Jew, elected Jew. Now, they were not there representing their religious community. They were citizens of Ukraine that represented the entire country irrespective of their religious denominations. None of them represented religious communities in their public offices. And they were not elected because they were Jews or because they were Baptist ministers or because they were Catholic or whatever. And again, this is very unusual in any European countries, I have to admit. And this is what makes this country, I've been following developments in Ukraine for 30 years. And it is a sociological miracle what has happened to this country. A country that probably suffered more than any other country in the 20th century in terms of certain European disasters, catastrophes, genocides, etc. And yet the divergence, what has happened, the divergence between Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia, you could say they are very similar societies and how different they've gone. And it is because I, I go back to my writings in the 96, there is a, an essay I wrote, uh, uh, religious, no, ethno-linguistic and religious pluralism in Ukraine. And the ethno-linguistic and religious pluralism and democratic const construction in Ukraine. And I basically made a claim that the foundations are there. It's going to be a very slow process with a lot of problems, but there is no other alternative given if one analyzes public opinion polls as a sociologist in Ukraine. Against experts that were saying the country was going to divide in two, or was going to go nationalist, or was going to go Russian, I basically made the counter argument. And it was precisely because I saw there were, yes, they were Ukrainophone Ukrainians, they were Russophone Russians, but half of the population were Russophone Ukrainians. And that's why it was these that kept the country together. So when Putin says Russian speakers, half of the population of Ukraine are Russian speakers, but the first people I met were Russian speakers who had never spoken Ukrainian in their life. I couldn't understand Russia, so because of me, they had to switch to Ukrainian. And I realized those were Ukrainian patriots, Russian, ethnic Russians, speaking Russian, but committed to Ukrainian democracy. And this is what has happened, this is what we observe today. So I, I'm only saying this because to understand this war. On the other side, you have, of course, a Russian Orthodox Church that uh, came out of the um, Soviet period with a lot of scars, a lot of problems. For a while, there was a window of opportunity to go in the direction of civil society, religion, a public religion in civil society. But then, of course, they were embraced by the state. They very much liked this embrace. And the result is today the theology and the ideology of the Ruski Mir, the notion there is one single country, Russia, which is Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia is one single country, and one single language, Ukraine does not even exist as a language, and one single church, the Orthodox Church Moscow Patriarchate, and this is one part of the Ruski Mir. The other is, of course, that this Russian Orthodox Church is also the defender of traditional Christian values against the decadence of the West, against the European Union, against feminism, and liberalism. And this goes back to 2004 when uh, 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 Archbishop Hilarion gave his lecture in Melbourne. Go and read this lecture in 2004, where he argued precisely that Russia was the defender of Christianity against the decadent West. And then came 2005, uh, uh, he's in a, in a a platform like this with Casper, Cardinal Casper, and Hoover representing the evangelical church in Germany and basically attacking Hoover as the representative of this decadent atheist secular West and the need for the Catholics and the uh, uh, Russian Orthodox to form a strategic alliance. Yeah, there were problems with Filioque and of course the big problem was the Uniatis. If you get rid of the Greek Catholics, then there will be no problems with Rome and Moscow. But then let's make a strategic alliance. 
And this is what they've been doing. This is what's called the culture wars. And people have analyzed the culture wars for the last 10 years. But very few people thought that the culture wars would become real, real wars of extermination. Mm -hmm. This is what basically we are seeing uh, the attempt today. So religion remains a, a great potential yeah. and a problem, especially if, and here is I, I am going to use the word of Hans Joas, his latest book, The Power of the Sacred. The power of the sacred, we know from Durkheim, is to sacralize communities. The question is, what do we sacralize? Do we sacralize our <laughs> collectivity, our, let's say, the supremacy of a race, or of a class, or of a nation, or do we have an idea, and this is what the axiality means, a universal principle, which does not allow to sacralize any particular group, any particular society. And ultimately, this is what, uh, uh, then when people talk of religion and violence, I say the issue is the sacred. And whether this religion is there to desacralize violence or to sacralize violence in the name of any kind of community. And I think that this is the lesson we are seeing today, that uh, this could come back to the European scene precisely in very similar ways in which it has been there for centuries. Okay, so, I think, sorry. Thank, thank you, Jose, and let's come back to Ukraine in, in some more detail, because it is so vitally important and illustrates a lot of the, the points that you've both, both raised. But before we do, maybe maintain a, a universal or global lens just for a little bit here on your work, but also Charles's work, and we have both titles of, of, of your major works, uh, or some of your major works uh, in the title of this panel. And it strikes me that there's some interesting parallels between your, your careers. And one, I, I think, um, is that you come out of the Catholic Christian tradition. Um, you reflect out of it. Your sources, at least in your, your book and in, in this book, A Secular Age, are primarily Western Eurocentric. And yet you're making universal arguments, as evoked in the titles, Public Religions in the Modern World, A Secular Age. And of course, you've been criticized, in part, for coming out of a particular tradition and making a universal argument in a global era where we've got all this diversity of belief, perspective, historical experience. Could you each reflect a little bit on, on that, sort of the limitations, if you like, of your own point of view and your work and how you've tried to meet that criticism and broaden your own horizons by bringing in other cultural perspectives? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, is, my book is paradoxical from that point of view because <clears throat> I have to explain this a bit autobiographical. Yes. I was for a long time in a political science department in which this modernization theory got me more and more and more riled up, particularly here this idea of secularization was a world movement, but it's like a long caravan, and the leading the caravan was the West, and then the others were sort of hobbling along uh, behind as they gradually caught on to the truth and so on. And this, I thought this was nonsense. So I thought that how to get a theory of secularization as a universal, you can't start there. You have to look at particular cases. So I thought I'd write a book about reading Latin Christendom and what followed. All right, so from that point of view, it was very narrow. Yeah. But the, I mean, again, autobiographically, I was deeply, deeply impressed by the phenomenon of the axial age. And if anyone reads the book, you'll see that. The, axial age plays a very important role. And so it goes along with an implicit sense of history of working out certain of the axial insights, which uh, get worked out in new versions and deeper versions, right? So that the axial insights, they start off as only livable by small minorities who are marginal, right? The, uh, Louis Dumont talks about an individual Dumont, the individual outside the world. And then they gradually get become serious demands. I mean, take something like slavery. Well, it was accepted by the early Christianity, not very, not very nice, not very. But then you get in the 18th century a real demand that it would be abolished. Incidentally, the, the fire behind that was mainly in evangelical, I think you even said, right? But at the same time, 
this creates tremendous reactions. And what you see is another kind of progress, I think another kind of movement, where there are new interventions with new ways of acting in politics, of which a good example is Gandhi, right? That, you know, there have to be, the, we get these higher standards of self-determination, and that dictates that colonial peoples rise up, right? But the, the insight that violence is going to create more violence, and if you do this by nonviolence, you can move the whole of society, the whole world to, uh, further because you can retain a reasonable friendship with the former uh, rulers, right? And I think you can see that, that that is still moving. So that was the kind of thing that was behind, not in the text of the, of the book, but right. very much uh, dictating this. So that, in a certain sense, I was uh, and I was influenced by a number of the writers of, that I mentioned who, who influenced uh, Vatican II, the I'm never thinking of the Conga and the mm -hmm. back and so on. That was my orientation from the beginning. Jose? Yeah. How to, everything is autobiographical. I mean, um, even the four case studies are very clearly my autobiography, right? I, to a certain extent, the book is the way it is because I studied theology in Germany. And I'm very satisfied when I go to Germany and they tell me that they read my book as a sociology coming out of German theology, right? Um, and yes, this aspect. The second, obviously, Spain was my obsession for many years, right? Why, the, why Spain is so different from the rest of Western Europe, right? This was where I grew up, fascist Spain, national Catholicism. So I had very few if you wish, illusions about uh, the Catholic Church, right? So it's not that somehow everything Catholic is good. So, and yet, something radical, transformative happened. And uh, liberation theology was one of them. Again, Latin America. Uh, if the chapter on Brazil, it's not only on Brazil, it's the whole transformation of Latin American Catholicism. Yeah. And then the chapter on Poland, probably I could not have written without the Ukrainian connection that allowed me to read Polish. Ultimately, you can really not write these histories without knowing the language and the yeah. people and somehow. And so you have to understand the phenomenology. And for me, it was so crucial because Polish Catholicism, when you see Catholic workers kneeling in the shipyards to take communion, this will be unthinkable anywhere in Spain. The working class in Spain, will, in, in the shipyards, will take communion. I mean, come on, what are you talking about? So again, and then again, so seeing that the Spanish Catholicism, Polish Catholicism, Brazil, were so radically different. And then, of course, American Catholicism when I came here. So this is precisely what, what makes this important. And again, I, I would like then you to uh, bring um, in 2015, right after the war, the war has, for Ukrainians, they always say the war started in 2014. This is what was only a war that was limited. Now it's turning into a war of extermination, but the war started in 2014. And right after the war, Bishop Bores and Bishop Hleb had an initiative. We had a conference in, in Kiev about how to think of peace and reconciliation after the war when it was still much more thinkable than it is today. Which is, so I would like you to bring uh, this question, yeah. which is a very painful question <clears throat> today. Well, uh, at that point, uh, it, uh, we, we saw that uh, we need some time, and probably now we need maybe more time, but war quickens things as well. Uh, the first two saints of y Ukraine they're also recognized by uh, Russia, are uh, two sons of Saint Volodymyr or Vladimir, the one who brought Christianity uh, to the Kiev and Rus state in 988. When he died in 1011, there was a struggle for succession uh, of the Kievan principality's throne. And uh, one of the brothers, um, basically decided to attack two of his other brothers, and they said, we will 
This is before, mm -hmm. 900 years before Gandhi and, and um, Martin Luther King and Nelson Mandela. Uh, we will not raise our sword against you. And they were killed. And they became the first canonized saints. And of course, canonizations always respond to a need in a society, because there's many people who are holy. But you canonize the ones that give a particular message. So they were canonized before their father, who brought Christianity uh, to the country. Uh, but uh, they are rather um, effectively forgotten. Uh, Boris and Hlib, or Boris and Gleb, are not very popular names in Ukraine. You don't have many churches. And uh, so we, we began founding a, a brotherhood, uh, which uh, I think has you know, a prophetic, prophetic mission, uh, but uh, it doesn't have many adherents at this point. Uh, and I find it very difficult, you know, uh, when Cardinal Parolin says, well, yes, Ukraine has a uh, right to defend itself, but America shouldn't give them weapons. These are, the, you know, it, these are very difficult, difficult questions. Uh, and now we're talking about therapy uh, post factum. What will we do to address the trauma of 11 million people that have left their homes? or as we speak now, 50,000 probably have been killed, including the Russian soldiers. Maybe a quarter of a million people have been injured uh, with this offensive that is beginning basically as we speak. Uh, this can be doubled in, in two weeks. Um, and how long it lasts, uh, no one knows. But going back to Jose's work and to the work of all of you, um, Understanding reality is very important. Uh, because when things are built on illusions, on fantasies, on ideologies, uh, the, the prospects of problems increases. And uh, Jose was one of those who pointed out important things, um, which particularly explain why Ukrainians today, are, it's the only country, only people that's not afraid to stand up to Russia. You know, a friend of mine, uh, the bishop in London, was saying, you know what it's like today? It's like people sitting around a swimming pool and seeing a child drowning and saying, should we throw a life preserver? No, no, it seems like she's swimming, you know? Let, let her swim a little bit more. Uh, and... Um, no, no, we got to throw a rope. Not a life preserver, but a rope. Uh, so uh, we, we have, uh, there's, uh, there will need, there will be a great need for a big examination of conscience of all the Russian studies centers, of the foreign policies. All the foreign policies of Europe were geared to assure peace, and there's war. So these foreign policies failed. Why they failed? Well, I think there was a miscomprehension of society, both of Russian and Ukrainian society. And uh, those things are very expensive, those kind of mistakes. Uh, some, some honest politicians are beginning to say, like the president of Germany, I was wrong. We were wrong. Uh, others, you know, in Italy, two absolutely polar personalities, the Donald Trump of Italy, uh, Berlusconi, and Romano Prodi, had one great thing in common. Personal friends of uh, Vladimir Putin, and going on vacations together. Uh, and being incapable of understanding what every Soviet veteran traumatized by a totalitarian system knows. A KGB person who has not turned, turned, has not turned away from that legacy but, but builds on it is eminently dangerous because 
that system is completely immoral, amoral. It's cynical. Uh, it's connected with defending genocide. And it's capable of repeating it. And today, the, the language is genocidal. The intent is, if necessary, to work in a genocidal way. The numbers don't, don't uh, uh, today merit the term genocide. But if you look at the language, and maybe Jose can send, uh, you know, uh, Timothy Snyder wrote a kind of very good uh, analysis of uh, a recent article in an official uh, newspaper. The language of Nazification, Nazi, what does it mean? There are no Nazis in Ukraine. France just voted, had its election, 52% of the French population voted for extreme candidates. 23 for Marie Le Pen, seven for that other guy, what's it? Zemmour. Zemmour. And, uh, and uh, Melan, with Mel Melanchon was 22%. Uh, 52% uh, are voting for extremes. In Ukraine, in, in the elections, 2% vote for the far right. 73% voted for a Jewish man. But what is the reason? What is, what is, how, how is society manipulated? Not only Soviet society, but Western European society or intellectual circles. Because if you call somebody a Nazi, somebody who is a Nazi is out, out of Georgetown, out of Washington, out of Berlin, out of Madrid even today. Uh, and in Russia, for Russian soldiers, that is a monster. So you can kill, you can destroy. Ukrainians are Nazis. What is the definition of a Nazi in Ukraine? A Ukrainian that refuses to be Russian, that doesn't want to speak the Russian language. This is what these articles are now saying. So a lack of sociological critical analysis and the critical analysis of empire, of colonization, the critical analysis of church's engagement in colonization. Today, uh, the whole sociological world of sociology of religion studies the wages and, and the scars of colonization. And we, we rethink, we repent. Uh, this, this is not happening in Russia, quite the opposite. Uh, uh, the, the religious ideology is, is used to justify this war. And 700 university presidents have signed a document supporting uh, the, the policy of the president. So that is why what happens in academia, what happens in sociology, is, is very important. And that's why I'm, I'm very grateful for, for the work you, you all do. And particularly, I think today we're celebrating mm -hmm. you know, the work of Jose. So. Thank you. So thank you for, for those moving words and, and for your witness. I'm, um, I'm trying to come up with uh, questions that cut across um, all three of our speakers here. And there are some. We've already touched on them. One, one strikes me um, is the future of ecumenism, and I'll try to relate it briefly to, to your work. Um, Charles, you mentioned yourself that you were shaped by uh, the, the revival of optimism, ecumenical uh, progress after the war, Catholics and Protestants in particular, um, that that's a model that, that shaped your, your view of what's possible in the public square through religious interaction in a positive vein. Jose, your idea of global de denominationalism, maybe um, building on your normative impetus in your 94 book about the positive possibilities of religion in the public sphere, suggests, and you've argued that there's a positive process of mutual recognition that's going on at the global level. Um, in, we, we talk about it as interreligious dialogue, but there are other ways of thinking about that. Um, and yet, here we are in the context of Ukraine seeing the horrible uh, politicization of religion, to borrow a, a term from Jocelyn's uh, new book. Um, in Russia, parts of 
the rest of the world around this conflict, other conflicts. How do you revive ecumenism in the face of this brutal um, instrumental, instrumentalization of, of religion that we're seeing in Ukraine and, and elsewhere? Yeah. I don't know, Charles, do you have any thoughts on ecumenism well, today? I yeah. just don't know how in the immediate situation, I mean, I agree with uh, Bishop Boris that uh, you know, you have to throw the uh, life raft, uh, <laughs> which you mean, w w help them with weapons. But in the long run, how are we going to fight against people who have that same mentality, right? The same mentality of, which really takes us to the, what's called very generally populism at the moment in, in the West, you know, Trump, uh, Le Pen, and so on. That is political movements that are based on the idea of excluding and as inferior as dangerous, one part of the population. <clears throat> and so the, people say we have to, we have to find the condition that put this in, which I don't, I couldn't really name now, by yeah. conditions of being able to exchange with them as human beings with their own identities and so on. And partly this can be done, but it's very, very difficult to combine with a strong struggle against them yeah. politically, which is also absolutely necessary. Right? You don't want to get Trump reelected here and the rest of the world <clears throat> certainly doesn't want to see that. And so there, but there are various ways of, of doing this. I mean, you're gonna uh, appeal to some of the voters who go for Trump here or Le Pen there by thinking of their legitimate uh, demands, legitimate demands, people that have been left aside, that have been uh, lost their jobs, for instance, in the Rust Belt here because of a, a very mindlessly carried out globalization under the ideology of neoliberalism, and it'll all work out, et cetera. <clears throat> and in a way, to be very you know, fair, uh, Biden did some of that in the last election. That is, he was trying to appeal to some of the workers that voted the time before for Trump by appealing to these, these needs. So you can create uh, various bridges like that. <clears throat> but it's, it's a long, tough, tough struggle. Uh, about what, I mean, the thing to avoid is this sense of uh, we're so superior and these are just rednecks and so on. But there is a, you know, there's a long-term possible solution out of this, but it requires really seeing the whole picture of these people as human beings and finding ways of, of engaging with them and so on. I mean, the, the tragedy at the moment in, in countries like this and ours is that you have this wonderful moment, <laughs> the pandemic, I mean, had positive possible consequences because we're all in it together. But, what we find is that the means of fighting that get caught up in this, yeah. Thing, yeah? And so we had all, all the truckers in Canada coming from the West and so on, and they're saying, you know, <clears throat> you're crushing our rights, et cetera. And, you know, I mean, so it's a very, very difficult thing to do, but uh, if we think of that fight on these two levels all the time, mm -hmm. I think we can hope to move some of the yeah, but when you come internationally, well, how you deal with Putin? I mean, you know, it's just. Yeah. I think only. Well, I think the question is how to maintain a normative analysis without becoming partisan in the polarization wars, right. and to maintain this kind of critical distance. Uh, precisely, we are with Jocelyn. We are beginning this project on theologies and practice of religious pluralism to understand how the different traditions have come to terms with accepting pluralism. Pluralism of the other and pluralism within, because pluralism within is central to accept the pluralism of the other. Um, and I guess the, the fundamental insight when I call, what I talk of global denominationalism at the level of the world system of religions is this idea, each religion today claims to be unique and different and to have the right to be different and yet somehow claiming also to be, have a message for all of humanity. It is what distinguishes precisely the best of religious ecumenism. However, 
once the religious dialogue gets into the polarization wars, this comes to an end. And, and this is precisely what I experienced with uh, when I mentioned Archbishop Hilarion in a panel like this, yeah. where precisely a conference organized to understand the dialogues of religion in Europe, the dialogue between the three Abrahamic religions, the dialogue between the three Christianity, Christianities, the dialogue between Poland and Germany, the dialogue between the new Eastern European countries and the European Union. There comes this person and basically substitutes all of it for strategic alliances. Yeah. Strategic alliances to fight what uh, uh, our friend Spadaro has called the ecumenism of hate, where you find precisely then religion siding with other religions against somebody else, or are siding all of them together against the secular. So yes, this is a fundamental question. How do we uh, are able, but we see in our own secular politics, we are not very able to do it today. We find how this polarization has cut across basically all our debates, all our political organization, practically in every democracy. So it's not uh, about religion per se, the problem is religions get caught up in these dynamics today, mm -hmm. more than they being the ones that produce the dynamic. They get caught up and they are not able to somehow stop it or uh, uh, counter it. So this is the, 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 the fundamental question today, to which extent uh, some fundamental tenets of the religious traditions still allows them to maintain this. Uh, um, I mean, I was always struck by, I mean, Pax Christi International. We know that it started in France in the midst of the war as a project. And French Catholics going to German Catholics and saying, well, we have to come back. We have to end these 70 years of war somehow. And we see how the Polish Catholics did the same with the German Catholics, the bishops. It was they themselves, the Polish, that, that began. So in this respect, yes, it will be eventually the Ukrainians that will have to help the Russians come to death with their own history. But this is, will not be easy. And this happens at, at all the levels, whether it's the level of racism, and the level of colonialism, any form of domination, what you call both domination of one religion or, or intra-religious domination. Fundamental is a question, is the, 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 yeah, the inability to yeah. accept the others as equal, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Archbishop Kujak. Would you like to comment on ecumenism? I know it's a strange time to be thinking well, about it in the midst I mean, of war. It, uh, yeah. it, you know, it is the gospel, uh, and I think I think you you. Uh, when I was a bishop in Paris, I would bring Ukrainians, uh, especially when we were talking about this brotherhood of Buddhists in Lib, uh, brotherhood of reconciliation. Um, we would take them to Verdun, where uh, in a span of 300 days, 900,000 people were either killed, maimed, or lost in action. That's what uh, uh, 3,000 people a day. And uh, nearby is uh, Reims. Reims, uh, with its ancient cathedral, where in, I think, 1962, if I'm not mistaken, there was uh, an ecumenical mass, a mass uh, attended by Charles de Gaulle and uh, the Chancellor of Germany. Um, Kohl. Adenauer, was it? Adenauer, right, right. Adenauer. And, um, uh, de Gaulle didn't go to communion because he never went publicly as president uh, to <laughs> communion. But there's a mass, and if you go there, right in front of the cathedral, there's a big stone that says, this is the place where you know, the leaders of France and Germany <coughs> came together before God to say, we have to stop this. And it worked. I mean, there were others. There was, I mean, there uh, the one who was a French prime minister, foreign minister. Schumann. Schumann. Schumann, uh, mm -hmm. Schumann started the conversation during the war right. yeah. already. And I think there's uh, the process of his canonization has begun. So you, I think you, you need to stop, start uh, 
during the war, but you have to start with in the right place at the right time in the right manner. Um, I'm preparing now, to, let's say, if, to formulate some statements about this for the Holy See, some modest proposals mm -hmm. that the Holy See should approach this uh, in, with the methodology that it approached child abuse. You listen to the victim first, the victim first. You listen to the victim and zero tolerance for the abuse. Then you can start, you know, inviting the abuser and the abused or symbols thereof to carry a cross together. Otherwise, it, you know, it, it's just not, I mean, psychologically, it, you, that's not how you deal with trauma. That's abstract ideas of people in a comfortable position that are making statements that have a very paradoxical message in, in the context. Uh, now, if you want to speak to everybody else and not to the people that are at war, okay, but uh, it's, um, it's problematic. Um, and I had a long conversation yesterday with the nuncio, and in, in the end, not the one in Washington, another nuncio. Uh, and he said, well, thank you. It's important to hear these things. Uh, it's a very difficult thing, but we, we are, uh, Ukrainians realize, I think, that they can't move their country, you know, and place it in the armpit between Brazil and Argentina. <laughs> you know? We're condemned. We're condemned to this neighborhood. And um, we be I believe that it is going to be our mission through a dedication to tolerance, democracy, freedom of the press, freedom of religion, dignity of human beings, to make a message and spread this you know, to Russia, to Belarus. Uh, and uh, I, think, I think it will happen. Because the, you know, war is war, and you know, it's not uh, a bed of roses in the language and gestures uh, of the defenders of the innocent are, can be brutal and vulgar. But in the end, defending the innocent is an act that ennobles. And I hope that uh, nobility will give strength. It's already, you know, it's, the battle is 12 to 1 in terms of budgets, planes, tanks. Uh, and uh, somehow David is standing up, up to Goliath. And, this has brought new questions and new senses to the European Union. It has, uh, after concerted attempts to destroy North Atlantic cooperation, it has rejuvenated this cooperation. In this city, Democrats and Republicans vote unanimously on, <laughs> on, on an issue. Uh, so, and for Ukrainians themselves, uh, the political, political class will, with difficulty after this return to, you know, the corrupt styles of the past, although it's possible. Uh, and uh, um, I think it's a very important moment. If all of us who consciously lived through the Vende, through the, you know, changes in 89, 90, 91, realized that that was a great liberation. I don't know what, half a, half a billion of people uh, stopped living under totalitarianism. The religions of the Soviet Union got a new life. And in Ukraine, for example, specifically Catholic social doctrine, which was systematically enunciated, particularly by the Ukrainian Catholic Church, with about 10 documents a year on all kinds of issues, um, contributed to a discourse in society that uh, basically explains also who Zelensky is today. The language, the, the, the posture. Uh, Zelensky is the people. Now, Zelensky, you know, in December, he had a very embarrassing five-hour press conference. He's, uh, seven years ago, he made jokes about the Ukrainian genocide. Very you know, like money-making comedian. 
but we can transform. We can rise to the occasion. We believe in God's grace. Uh, we believe that after this Lent and this Passion, and this is Passion Week in Holy Week in Ukraine, uh, you know, there will be a resurrection. And this is my last thing I want to say, because uh, Jose speaks about a critical distance, but that doesn't mean uh, disengagement. And I, I am inspired and, and love the fellowship of Jose because he believes in the resurrection. He's not only a, you know, a student of religion, but he's, he's a follower of Jesus. And I think that really animates, animates the scholarship. Let's bring some critical distance. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, we also have to remember from transitions to, from authoritarian to democratic regimes, you cannot have reconciliation without truth. Yeah. You cannot have, you need memory, justice, truth, and reconciliation. You cannot have peace without just <clears throat> those things. Are, so any, any attempt <clears throat> to just work for peace without justice, yeah. for reconciliation without truth, just leads us nowhere. So it's simply, and this is something we, we have learned from the South African Commission, from Latin America, and from post-authoritarian regimes. So we simply have to stick to also these things we've learned as, as, mm. as critical scholars. Thank you, thank you. All right, well, let's um, open it up to the audience for a wider conversation. We have a couple of roving mics. Comments or questions? Dave Buckley here, and then John Borelli after that. Raise your hand, Dave. Yeah. Great, thanks to, to each of you for that. Um, I'm wondering for the panel, I think, if you could continue on the door that Jose just cracked open talking about truth and sort of how one of the dynamics in this current moment, comparative, whether you want to call it democratic backsliding or, or war in the Ukrainian case, is this, this question about truth and disinformation and sources of authority about basic settled historical facts or even contemporary facts. I'm curious how, if at all, you think about that as impacting your scholarly work, uh, Charles and Jose, um, or the practical work of um, of ministry in this environment? Because I do think it's a, it, at least in my reading of your work, Jose, it, I don't think it was directly on, uh, on the table, or maybe one of the roles of public religion would have been in recovering truth about the authoritarian period um, in a kind of optimistic way in some of those transitions. Um, but it, I think it, it seems like that it, it's darker now or more, more uncertain now about the, the very sort of stability of truth in some of these contexts. So open up. Uh, I mean, no doubt, because, you know, what, what I <clears throat> would have said if you'd asked me this question, uh, let's say, 10 years ago, <laughs> or was, well, I mean, in the context of a dictatorial regime, obviously people are lied to, but in the context of a, our kind of society, it should be pretty easy to verify totally uh, non-facts, and that should settle the matter. But something is working in our present system of media plus some perhaps psychology of, of, you know, of, of uh, echo chambers that may be always ready to work, but in, in, a, in combination with our system of media, particularly the, the platforms, which uh, are blocking that, are making it impossible to get through to certain people, that the, what the, you know, like the number of people who believe that Bush won the, the, that, uh, sorry, that uh, Trump won the last election, which is extraordinary, the maintenance of a, okay? And I can think of some uh, attempts to get, get at this. I mean, obviously, more careful policing of the platforms is tremendously necessary. And it goes against their own uh, monetary interest. That's part of the problem, because the, the more you get people riled up, the more people get onto the platform, the more you can charge <laughs> you know, the people that are, are advertising. So that, but also, I think that we have to have a, a regime of truth uh, in, uh, in non, in, you know, uh, the word, uh, uh, traditional media. I mean, 
this uh, Fox News, they're, they're careful that they, on the news section they don't say absolutely ridiculous things, but they allow people who are just commentators to go online, and they're tremendously influential. So I think we need some kind of legislation here. If, if I insult a particular politician and say that he's taking money from somebody, he takes me to court and I pay a huge <laughs> fine and I have to issue a correction. But if somebody like Dr. Carlson says you know, something absolutely, totally damaging to the political system in which he's operating, he gets away scot-free because it's just entertainment. You know, they, they, should yeah. have, they should have known that this is just entertainment. So, so we're going to need some change in the legislation to, uh, to correct that. But I, I freely admit I don't have all the answers to this question. It's a really very difficult question. It's a new problem. I mean, the post-truth regime, I mean, this is really something which is very, I mean, I, I really cannot understand. Obviously, out of the Soviet Union, the experience was the importance of truth. Whether you look in somebody like Basla Havel, whether you look at somebody like Jean Paul II, this was the fundamental idea, right? Uh, uh, and now, from within democracies, to come to the sense in which precisely uh, we can challenge the very notion of, of, of truth and anything goes. And we don't know how to deal with it yet. We don't know how to deal with it. But we have to recognize that we all have to be consciously aware of the role we play precisely in reproducing especially these polarizations. Uh, and it's uh, predictable now sociologically how these things work out. And so we have to be very aware of, of it, right? The sociology of knowledge tells us that those things. I mean, I remember uh, we visited Ukraine together with Charles when the secular age was translated into Ukrainian. And then we had actually a seminar. There was a Templeton Foundation project to bring together post-doctor uh, scholars, young scholars from Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine, precisely to discuss religion in the public sphere. So Charles gave a talk, I gave a talk. I was going to work together with them for the uh, for another year, we are going to go to Minsk to have the second uh, year of the project. So I committed myself to work with these young scholars. And then came the war. Came the war, and because of the war, the Russians said, no, we, we are going to supposed to meet in Kiev first. I said, and they said, no, we cannot go to Kiev because we will not agree to the humiliation of having to ask for a visa to go to Ukraine. So let's meet in, in, in St. Petersburg. And I said, well, I'm sorry, but uh, given uh, uh, the situation of the war, which has been started by Russia, but claims that it's not part of the war, which is same like now, right? It's not a war, it's only... So the very fact that you deny the involvement of Russia in the war, in the Donbass war, and uh, when I made this issue, oh, well, anyhow, we know Casanova is a Ukrainian nationalist, anyhow, and we know his arguments, anyhow. So there was something that was broken. We were, had been working together on this project, and then suddenly, Something has changed, and we cannot have any more this working together of Ukrainians, Russians, and Belarusians. Uh, so yes, those things uh, are broken, and, and how to then put them together again? It's a task for all of us. Mm -hmm. You know, I listened very carefully to what you were saying, Rajiv, in your, when you were up here, uh, uh, because much of it pertains to this war, but also the fact when you were saying that religion and secularity, whatever, they, these are Western concepts that don't fit our, our reality. And the question is, you know, what is this concept of truth? Is it a notion? Is it an idea? Which e very easily becomes an ideology. Uh, in, in the gospel, the truth is personal. Jesus says, I am the truth, uh, the way in life. And Ultimately, it's in relationship. From the Christian point of view, it's in the Trinitarian relationship. There's no, there's no truth out there, you know. I'd grab it. it it's, it's, in, it's in the relationship of love. That's where truth is. That's, that's truth. But somewhere out there, it's just a notion which is very clearly now manipulated and inverted inside out like a sock. So I think, I think the capacity that you were calling us to, to 
look at our concepts, um, you know, outside, you know, the both sides of the Atlantic, uh, is maybe a way of um, recovering what we all need in the concept of truth. But not only in the concept, in the reality, in its incarnate presence among us. Thank you. Um, John, you are next. Yeah. Thank you. I was just wondering, in the form of a question, um, isn't the response to the future of ecumenism, looking at Ukraine, uh, more in terms of what you've been talking about in terms of a variety of pluralisms in the world. The ecumenical movement in the last 125 years has been largely uh, a movement among North Atlantic Christians following a particular pattern. In some ways, the Orthodox have been part of this, but on the periphery. Often in Western Europe and the United States, they've been involved. But we're beginning to see that there's a different dynamic playing out in different parts of the world. In the Middle East, about the time Jose was publishing his book on public religion, the Orthodox Church there, the Catholic counterpart, the Melkite Church, the Syrians and Syrian Catholics were ready to come together. They, they felt that it, their situation required, let's reestablish full communion for our survival. But Roman Constantinople, no, no that's, that's not the dynamic, you can't do that. We have a pope who brings his relationship with Pentecostals from Argentina to Rome and shakes things up ecumenically. He's the first pope since Vatican II, first pope ever to visit the Valdensians in Turin in their home place. So he's shaking that up with a different dynamic. And I'm thinking, I almost have a sense that the leadership of the Russian Orthodox Church as Putin is warring against Ukraine, is warring against Bartholomew. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. That it's, that's it's, going on, it's, and that yeah. has to be worked out. They haven't solved that issue to even be part of an ecumenical movement. Yeah. They're probably mad at Bartholomew for recognizing his mm -hmm. Ukrainian uh, church. Yes, but, but, yeah. the, but the problem in this sense has been, I mean, I, as you know, I am a great fan of this pope. I mean, every respect, and this issue precisely because he has committed himself so much to the culture of the encounter with Kirill. And he takes for granted Bartholomew. But the fact is that all our friends, from Comunitas and Esidio to all Catholic ecumenists, have been together in forums with the Russian Orthodox, which by definition meant neither Ukrainian Orthodox nor Greek Catholics cannot be in the same forums, because they are persona non grata for the Hilarion. So if we invite Hilarion to give the keynote in the big interreligious conference, or in Madrid, or who knows where, then neither Ukrainian Orthodox nor Greek Catholics can be there. And, this, and the Catholic Church has gone along with this condition. Yeah, my question is, this war has been going on for centuries between Moscow and Constantinople. The whole thing of Third Rome, all of that. Oh, well, but no, but, there's but no, the, no. this is how it's playing out now in this war, and yes. I think this war I was following very much what the Archbishop, Archbishop Boris, was saying about it's going to take a remedy now of Ukraine, in some way, Ukrainians, to mediate this war that's never been disputed, never been solved in the Orthodox Church. But this is what I've been saying for a long time. Ukraine has the future where the three Romes can meet together because precisely you have three churches, one, one in communion with the Pope, one in communion with Bartholomew, the other in communion with Moscow. So if they can get together along in Ukraine, then of, of course this is the best contribution they can make to certainly to Christian ecumenism. Yeah. This, but it's something which the Greek Catholics have been saying for a long time. This was the whole idea of, of uh, Septetsky. This is the whole idea of, of, of so this is the idea of, of the Greek Catholics. Not and, like, and, you know, and that has been happening in this all Ukrainian uh, council of churches and religious organization, not on doctrinal grounds, but in in this uh, war, uh, the Moscow Patriarchate Church in Ukraine has criticized it since 214. Uh, and during the Revolution of Dignity, all the churches were there for prayer uh, together on, on the square. Uh, you said that it's impossible to imagine, you know, communion in the ports of Spain. 
well, uh, I was coming from Paris. You know, it's, uh, to, to the Maidan, it's impossible to imagine uh, a manifestation uh, en place de la République, which every hour has prayer. On the hour, every hour, you know, different representatives of different religions uh, uh, offered, offered prayer. Um, I think, you know, I think we need to uh, expand our horizons because things otherwise get very desperate. Uh, one way of expanding horizons is to realize that it can be much worse. <laughs> you know, uh, we can have a nuclear <clears throat> war. We don't think about it. It's unthinkable. But with all these nuclear toys, you know, someday some kid is going to just pull the wrong string. You know, actually, you need about a hundred people to launch a, a bomb. Uh, and you know, many hopeful experts say before you find all hundred to line up in Russia, somebody will pull a different trigger. Uh, but, um, you know, things change radically. Uh, the cradle of Christianity in many ways was Asia Minor. And there's, what, four or 5,000 Orthodox left in Turkey, a country of 80 million. And, you know, Augustine's hippo, and I was a, I was a Bishop, uh, what do you call it, uh, titular bishop of, of Karkadia. Uh, I think, I can't remember whether it's in Algeria or where, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a spot on an ancient map. In Tartibus in Fidelio. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Uh, and then, you know, <clears throat> the biggest Protestant country in 25 years will probably be China, with the biggest number of Protestants. There's 60 or 70 million already. 10 million Catholics, and the numbers are, and the persecution, which is increasing, will only increase the growth, as it always does, because the blood of martyrs is the seed of faith. Uh, things will be very different, you know, in 100 years. And, uh, you know, there might be 20 more thousand years. Uh, so we might be living kind of, from a Christian point of view, in the latter stages of primitive Christianity. You know, some historian at Georgetown, God willing, Georgetown will be around in 20,000 years, <laughs> will write, you know, Jose Casanova at the end of uh, the <laughs> primitive stage of Christianity wrote this sociology book, and you know, yeah, it was, was pretty way good. way ahead of his was, time. Yeah, it was way ahead of his time. <laughs> All right, on that optimistic note, no, we have, we have time for one more, one more question. Um, Rajiv, I see your hand. Um, uh, here in front, the mic. And then we'll, a, a comment, and then we'll ask the panelists if they have any final words. Yeah. No, I have a few comments. Uh, first, in response to the Archbishop. Uh, I think we recognize that there are many, many global problems in the world and we are all deeply interconnected with each other. But the epistemic framework within which we either identify those problems or look for solutions to those problems are still very heavily dominate, dominated by, you know, Judeo-Christian uh, or broadly modern Western secular. And there is a great need to bring uh, in a much deeper way a certain kind of cognitive ecumenism so that these other uh, frameworks are put on the table where there can be a proper dialogue discussion, generally uh, equal inter-religious, inter inter-civilizational dialogue to really change each other's epistemic frameworks. But and unless that is done, I don't think we're going to see a major change. It's, I'm responding to your point about yeah. religion, secular, yeah, which is- truth. Yeah. Yeah, what, what truth, yeah. truth for mean? that matter. Yeah. On, but the other thing, of course, is, uh, and I'm reminded of, you know, some, some of us have, have to really uh, stand up and, and really rise to the occasion 
uh, there was a small, a small town Muslim cleric in India who was asked at the time of the Christchurch cross mosque bomb, uh, you know, uh, terrorist yeah. bombings. He was asked to wear a black band uh, at the death of all the Muslims uh, there. And he refused. He refused because that call was from other Muslims. And he said that unless, that was a remarkable thing to do, I thought. He said, unless all of you wear black bands when Christians or Hindus are killed by Muslims, I shall not wear this black band. And I think that kind of generosity of spirit is so rare. And I think it has to start happening uh, if we really wish you know, uh, for things to change. Because it's, this is, it's not just enough. And this is, you know, people like Gandhi did that. So I keep mentioning because these are the people that I know. Gandhi, the idea was not just to step into other people's shoes uh, temporarily, but to, to really uh, you know, get into the shoes of the other to, to, and to walk with them for some time. Because that's the, it's empathy at a cognitive level is not enough, there has to be something else. So Gandhi actually thought that, at least for some time, and there's another guy, Ma, uh, Ramakrishna, uh, you know, in Bengal, who was the teacher of Vivekananda. He also believed that you have to become a Muslim for some time or become a Christian for some time uh, in order to really bring, bring about the necessary transformation uh, in yourself. So I think there is, there is that kind of uh, uh, a deeper change that is required. Uh, Thank you. I just want to say one more thing about news. Okay. Uh, I think uh, the biggest, the first big fake news was when Mr. Bush and Mr. Blair declared to the world that there are weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, despite the fact that they knew that it was completely wrong. And the entire news machinery perpetrated it. That was 20, almost 20 years ago. Uh, the alarm bells should have rung then. So it's not something that has happened in the last 10 years. Okay. It's something that has happened. In the, and uh, last thing, when I first visited America in 1975, I was astonished to see on television how advertisements were being played out. It was, you're not just advertising your product, you're actually grossly exaggerating the quality of a product and at the same time rubbishing the other products. I mean, I'd seen advertising in India, but this is something which is, I'd never seen before. And that's that, you know, you regimes of truth are created by this culture. Right. And this culture has been developing for a very long time. Uh, so I'm not that surprised about, you know, uh, uh, Fox News and fake news. And, yeah. Uh, we've got to pay much more attention. I think we were too, we were caught napping by all this, but it's been happening for quite some time. Thank you. Good points. Um, some final thoughts, but just a minute or two before we break. Jose? No? Charles? No. All right, well, um, thanks. It's been a very full uh, afternoon. Um, this has been a great continuation of the conversation, which we now invite you to pursue with us over a, a drink and a snack. We're having a reception in Healy Hall, which is the, the main building on the second floor, out not far from the president's office, a very nice space. And we have some colleagues from the Berkeley Center that will help those of you who don't know the place to find your way. So stay in groups, uh, stay connected, and uh, join me one more time in, in thanking, thanking the panel.